Hello, my name is Helen Schwartz, and I'll be your host for Absolutely Orchids. I've been growing orchids and teaching for over 20 years. What started as a hobby has become a way of life. For the next few weeks, I'm going to share some of what I've learned about orchids with you. We're here at the Miami International Orchid Show, one of the largest annual orchid shows in the world. Where do all these orchid lovers come from? What is it all about? It starts with a single orchid. This is the one most people are familiar with, the Cattleya. It's the corsage orchid. Remember when you wore these on your wrist, ladies? Maybe you still do. But there are thousands of different orchids growing wild in greenhouses all over the world. The orchid family is one of the largest families of flowering plants. Although most orchids grow in the rainforest, in tropic climates, in the subtropics, you could even find them in the Arctic. What is an orchid? Can you, how can you identify an orchid? All orchid flowers have three sepals and three petals, one of which is called the lip and is usually larger, and a central column containing both male and female sex parts. There are epiphytes and terrestrial orchids. An epiphyte grows on trees or rocks and derives food and moisture from the air. A terrestrial grows in the ground and is supported by soil. There are two main orchid groups, the sympodial and the monopodial. Sympodial orchids grow horizontally, connected by a rhizome. Cattleyas and dendrobiums are familiar examples of sympodial orchids. The monopodial orchid have a main stem that grows vertically with new leaves coming out of the center. Bandas and phalaenopsis are good examples of monopodial orchids. Orchids have a long life. With care, they can live forever. There are orchids in Florida and England that are over 100 years old. Orchid blooms are another matter. Some orchid blooms only one day during a 12-month period, some for six months, and then you'll find everything in between. So I suggest beginning orchid growers buy one blooming plant each month so that the following year you will have something you bloom most all the time. Where is the best place to grow orchids? Well, if you live in a warm climate, you can grow them on your patio or shade house. If you live in a seasonal state with a cold winter climate, you need to have a greenhouse with heat and um, protection for the orchids. Growing orchids is a wonderful way to beat stress. I can't recommend anything better. And once you start well, beware. Growing orchids can become an obsession. In the orchid family, there are hybrids and species. Man makes hybrids and God makes species. The genus is a family containing the species. Orchids are still evolving, so they are not stable and will allow crossbreeding. Uh, two or more different species crossed make a hybrid. We'll be talking more about this in upcoming programs because of the importance of identifying and labeling all of your plants. How do you get started growing orchids? One of the best things a beginning orchid hobbyist can do is to join the American Orchid Society. And my first guest on Absolutely Orchids is going to tell you why and how to join the society. Ned Nash is a former California grower who is now the Director of Education and Conservation for the American Orchid Society. Let's go to my greenhouse and meet Ned. Our first guest for this series is going to be the one that you're going to get all your information from. He's going to show you where to call, where to go, and everything you need to know about orchids. His name is Ned Nash. He's an American Orchid Society judge. He's director of education for the American Orchid Society in West Palm Beach. For many years was associated with a large firm in California. And without much more introduction, Ned? Hi, Helen. How are you? Hi, fine. Um, the American Orchid Society is probably the most important membership that you can have in your new orchid hobby. People who come into orchid growing are naturally fearful because it's a big hobby. There's a lot of new concepts to it. And one of the things that is not widely available is good information. The American Orchid Society is a not-for-profit membership organization with over 30,000 30, members. And um, our magazine is the most widely read orchid magazine in the world. It's, um, we've got over six, we figure over 60,000 people read it. It's an invaluable source of information. Um, we also have a, a, an, uh, a group of affiliated orchid societies. We have over 500 affiliated orchid societies that 
between the Affiliated Orchid Societies and the American Orchid Society, you can have just about all the information that you could ever possibly want to help you in your orchid hobby. You can have the resources of the American Orchid Society for your general uh, information, and you can have the resources of a local society, which is very, very important in learning how to grow orchids in your particular area. You can read how it's done in Africa or in California or in New York. We do publish a wide variety of, period or a variety of periodicals aside from the um, orchids. It's a new magazine. We've just was the AOS Bulletin for many years, and we've just changed it in our 75th anniversary to orchids, which really gives a better message of who we are and what we do. Um, we also publish the awards quarterly, which is a a um, a record of the awards that are given by the American Orchid Society judging system. It's a good way to keep up on what's current in hybridizing trends, what makes a good orchid. Um, we publish Lindleyana, which is a scientific journal, which is a more probably limited appeal to the hobbyist. Um, and then we have a book department where we have just about every important available book of, um, that's, and it's available to our members and to other people as well, although our members do get a 10% discount. Um, one of the books that Helen specifically asked me to bring with me today is our new Orchid Pests and Diseases. Um, orchids are, in general, a very pest-free type of plant because they're generally tough and unappetizing. However, in a tropical area like we have here, they will get their pests. And it's important to know, especially in today's regulated atmosphere, exactly what treatments are available to be used. Because in many cases, um, I know Helen's been growing orchids a long time, and even though I look pretty young, I've been growing them for a long time. And we both remember when it was go down to the garden shop and get um, dimethoate or chlordane or whatever it was. It was just as nasty as could be and killed them all dead. And we can't do that anymore. We have to be very aware of what's available and what is permissible to use on orchids. And um, this is the sort of resource that you need. I shouldn't shake it, I guess. Is the sort of resource that you need to um, to learn how to take care of your to take care of your orchid pest problems. Let me ask you something, Ned. Now, if I live in an area that doesn't have a lot of uh, nurseries and things, how, how would I find out where my society is? Um, that's a good question, Helen. That's one of the the primary reasons to join the American Orchid Society, and that's one of my tasks. Is when you say education, it sounds very it's very limiting. More what I like to think of myself as is the minister of information. And that's one of our biggest uh, charges is to make information available, such as I live in Overland Park, Kansas. Where's my nearest orchid society? Well, a call to the American Orchid Society at 407-585-8666 will not only get you membership, but it will get you information on where your nearest affiliated society is. With membership, you also get an almanac which lists all of the affiliated societies and where they are. Um, if you live in Overland Park, Kansas, you might also ask yourself, where do I even buy orchids? Well, that's another place where the, our publication Orchids comes in handy because in each issue that is published every month, in each issue, literally half of the magazine is devoted to advertising by commercial firms. Now, that may seem like sort of waste of paper to some people, but many of our uh, most dedicated readers go to the ads first. So you, you can learn, in many cases, I shouldn't say this because I don't want to short our editorial department, they do an outstanding job, but you can learn almost as much about orchids from the ads sometimes as you can from the rest of the magazine. That's very true, very true. I do that all the time. First place I go, right to the back. Of course, Helen, one of the most valuable things that you can do to learn about orchids, especially in your local area, is to find out where your local orchid shows are and go and visit them. Um, most societies these days, it seems like, have a show at some yeah. time of the year or, uh, or other, most commonly in the spring of the year or in the fall. And again, show schedules are always posted in the American Orchid Society's magazine. 
Um, it's a very good way to initiate yourself into the hobby, to see what's grown in your area by the hobbyists, to see what the commercial firms grow, to see how orchid plants grow, to see uh, many times they'll have vendors there, the commercial people will be vending, so you'll have a chance to not only meet the vendors from your local area, but also to see um, vendors from outside of the area and to have an opportunity to see how their plants appear. Because just like in any other um, consumer-driven industry, you want to buy plants from reliable vendors and you want the plants to look good initially because a, a person who doesn't care about the plant that they present to their customers, myself, I wouldn't buy from them. That's right. It's true. Um, of course, these days, jungle collecting orchids is considered very politically incorrect because it takes away from the biodiversity of the natural environment and uh, debases an already uh, rapidly declining um, set of circumstances. Um, one thing that Helen didn't mention is that one of my part of my title is I'm Director of Education and Conservation. So I have to be very concerned with the American Orchid Society's stance on conservation-oriented issues like biodiversity, like habitat um, salvage, and many things like that. As a consequence, and also because I was a commercial grower, I uh, encourage seed-grown orchids, seed-grown species. We cross two good ones together, and we get actually, in many, most cases, better flowers on plants that grow better. When man helps God a little bit, the, uh, in many cases, the product is even better than the original. Um, Helen has here two of them. This is one. This is a species. This is Brassavola glauca from Mexico and Central America. And these two are raised from seed. And you can see side by side that this is a larger, somewhat flatter and better flower. So you can see that we can, in the same way we take animal species, uh, for example, chickens, and we cross chickens together back and forth for many years, we have a better chicken than they originally found in the jungle. Uh, in the same way in this, and the added bonus is they grow better, and you have the good feeling that comes from not having raped the jungle. And I'm very happy that Helen took the time to invite me here today. And I'd like to invite all of you to join the American Orchid Society and to experience part of why we're all here. Thanks, Ned. The American Orchid Society is located in West Palm Beach. And here is the number to call for more information. Now let's take a quick look at some upcoming shows on Absolutely Orchids. You'll meet some expert orchid growers like Stephen Slaughter, former curator of orchids and gardens at Vizcaya Museum in Miami. Stephen recently addressed the European Orchid Congress on Paphiopelum, also known as Lady Slippers. Here's a sneak preview. So again, we're going to put the plant in there. That's our next step. This plant that we've cleaned off and, and shaken really well, we're going to kind of twist it around a little bit so that it fits without um, breaking any of the roots, being mm -hmm. real gentle. You want to hold, hold the plant down so that it doesn't escape and rise. And then we're going to take, um, you you, take our, our new potting media okay. and <clears throat> just gently pour it in around, shaking the pot so that it moves around. And, and Steve told me before the program that this is a regular orchid seedling mix. It has uh, bark and charcoal, tree fern, and aerolite, or some kind of sponge rock to provide aeration for it. Right. Okay, so we, we put this in gently on both sides. We kind of tapped it down. You'll notice that this uh, media is pretty flyaway. It's pretty dry and, and fine. So after we've uh, repotted the plant, we're going to take a little more of our wet sphagnum and put it on uh, both sides of the plant so that when you water your plants in the greenhouse, all the media doesn't come flying out. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want to pack it around it. You just want to use a little bit. And it will deteriorate over the, the um, next six months or so and become part of your potting mixture. Dr. Ruben Salida will also be joining us. He's a noted taxonomist and very famous for his lab work. 
He'll be showing us some of the fascinating ways in which nature provides pollination for orchids. Each orchid basically has one insect that pollinates it perfectly. There sometimes will be uh, accessory pollinators, but only one does it perfectly. And you can see she fits exactly perfect inside. Here's the, there are two little uh, appendages here, and she, her head fits perfectly inside those appendages. And she's looking for nectar. She has pushed the lip, the labellum down. She's pushing her way in there and looking for nectar. There's no nectar in there. So we're not sure why she's doing it. She's looking for nectar, but it's just not there. Uh, the orchid is deceiving this pollinator to come in and do it. Now, when she pulls out of there, and she will uh, try and take it off, but she can't. It's in, a, it's in a spot on her head where she can't reach it. It's in just the right spot on her head. She cannot reach it. She'll be very annoyed. She'll keep trying to knock it off, and she gets so annoyed, she leaves. And she will not visit another, that plant again for a while. So meanwhile, she finds another one in the wild, maybe an hour or two later, and she goes and pollinates, and she does the same thing again. They have a short memory, uh, so they go back. She'll go back and do it again. And then she's carrying the polynia. So the first flower she visits, when she goes in, she'll, she'll deposit the polynia and pick up a new pair on the way out. And you won't be afraid of potting and repotting after watching our hobbyist, James Assisi. Uh, James will explain the different kinds of media and why some pots are better than others to use, depending on the orchid plant and your growing conditions. So I think we go now to Helen's, Helen's media of choice which is long fibers, well, these two. sphagnum these two. moss. Yeah, these yeah, two, right. These pretty good. <clears throat> and this is uh, New Zealand sphagnum moss. And it's called that because it comes from New Zealand. It's expensive, too. That's oh, why it is expensive. This is much better, I'll it tell you. It is expensive. Yeah. Uh, this is moss that comes from bogs. And if you look at it, it looks like uh, little cellulose fibers and stuff. But it's funny, when you add water to it, it swells up like a football. And... When using this in a pot, um, what you'd like to do is, and I know Helen uses it this way, is she uses some styrofoam peanuts. And I remember mentioning this earlier, but I'll mention it again. Oh, be careful. They're using, yeah, they're using a lot of biodegradable peanuts made from starch. So before you use them in your pots, soak them in water for an hour or so so that you know that whether don't. or not they're not uh, the biodegradable kind, yeah. okay? That could lead to a lot of problems. They sure could. Uh, styrofoam goes in for drainage. Mm-hmm. Plant sits in the pot, and the sphagnum is wet, and it's worked around the plot, pot, excuse me, but you don't want to pack it real, real tight. Otherwise, you'll never get any water in there. You want to leave this little room to expand. Plus, the, air, the, the roots need air. Yeah, yeah sure they do. They like to have And they air. grow under controlled conditions. They grow real, real good. And this, what this is, this is in sphagnum. Yeah, real fine. And probably this here on the bench out there maybe gets watered about once a week, once every mm -hmm. 10 days. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, here in South Florida, the rain's going to do a lot more watering for you than that. Yeah. Okay. So what we want to do, I think, is spend a little time and focus on those folks who are going to grow outside. Right. Okay. Uh, let's you go back to our clay pot. Do I get some yeah. charcoal for you? Uh, that would help. All right. Okay. Uh, the clay pot, once again, dries a little better than the plastic pot. And with the clay pot, we've already got some drainage slits in the bottom. So whatever media you're going to use, you really don't have to put a lot of drainage down here. But once again, it's a good idea to let that plant have some air and let her breathe down the bottom. So we'll sprinkle some styrofoam down in the bottom and just make a little bed for ourselves and give us a little room to breathe. Okay, uh, we've put some styrofoam down here for drainage. And Helen, you know, I want to show you a good trick. A lot of folks do away with the styrofoam. And what they do is they take one of these little inexpensive mm -hmm. net pots. Yeah, I know. I've seen that. Turn this baby upside down, stick her in the bottom of the pot. And you boy, you, oh, yeah, does it work well. Especially if you want to grow a specimen. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these big plants, they rot right in the center. And mm -hmm. by putting one of these little plastic pots down there, the plant will go yeah. all the way around. I know. It and, I know. Yeah, I found it works real good on big plants. I know. Okay, well, let's get to some of these materials we okay. have. Okay. All righty. Dr. Martin Moat will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about Vanders. Martin is a grower, a poet, an author of Vanders their botany, history, and culture. Well, we're going to talk about Vandas and their relatives, which are really kind of a, a large group of, uh, of orchids that uh, are very closely related because they're all recently evolved. So the interesting thing about them is that even though they're a great big group and there are a lot of different kinds of them, they all kind of hybridize with one another, and they're some of the easiest orchids to grow here in South Florida. So uh, 
that's the other thing. I kind of have become fascinated by them as a, uh, as a boy and have grown them for uh, about 40 years. But uh, one of the fascinating things about them is that uh, they're just about the easiest orchid to grow uh, in South Florida. But uh, having said that, uh, they're the easiest to grow uh, kind of in a haphazard way, but they're one of the most difficult to grow to perfection. So uh, there's something there in the way of a uh, connoisseurship, and a, uh, a, there's a challenge that, uh, that's constantly there to grow these things better and better. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully we can, uh, we can talk about some of the, uh, the aspects of this thing. Great. Okay. It's all yours. <laughs> Well, you know, the first thing to know about these plants is that uh, they're what we call a monopodial orchid. What that means is a big fancy word meaning they have just one basic growing point. And that's up here at the top of the plant. But uh, then on the other hand, uh, you can uh, uh, get offshoots on them that will develop later on. But basically, these plants grow from one point. They produce leaf after leaf that unfolds one after another after another. Eventually, when they get mature enough, they, uh, they produce flower spikes out of those leaf axles. Um, these plants, unlike most orchids, do not ever really like to have any resting period. They grow constantly, Helen. And uh, that constant growth is something that uh, one needs to have a little bit of a feeling for. And uh, one needs to, uh, when we're, one's cultivating these, to try to encourage that, uh, that growth. Uh, and uh, try, above all, to put them in a situation where they're not stressed, where that growth ever stops. Um, the way to look at these plants are as truly tropical plants. They like a fairly constant warmth. They like a fairly uh, uh, even uh, uh, climate all year round. They don't like big shocks of cold uh, or uh, big shocks of, of drought necessarily. These things stress the plant. Um, and these plants are, I guess you could call them opportunists. Uh, they, uh, they, when things are good, they cook right along and they go great. And uh, however, if you make them unhappy, uh, then they tend to cut their losses. They, how often uh, do you water these? Well, that's always a good question. Uh, how long is a rope, uh, Helen? I know. Uh, I, and uh, we have what we modestly call Martin Motz's universal law of Vanda watering, uh, which goes like this. Uh, we like to look at the roots of the plant in terms of uh, the watering regime. And the roots of Vandas when they're dry and Vanda relatives when they're dry are white, uh, more or less like we see here on this, uh, this plant here, quite a white or gray color. This indicates that the root is dry. Uh, when these roots are saturated with water, on the other hand, they will turn overall dark green. If they're just betwixt and between, they'll be mottled, half white, half green. Okay. And what we like to do is we like to get these plants very, very wet uh, and then allow them to dry out. Not hard, hard dry, but uh, we like to uh, uh, saturate them with water and then let them dry to the point where the root is dry. Because like other orchids, uh, the biggest enemy of uh, Vanda orchids, Vandaceous orchids, is fungus. And the reason that these plants as a group are tropical, epiphytic ones, the tree lovers, rock lovers, uh, took to those harsh, harsh climates was in order to avoid fungus. Uh, mm -hmm. So the whole watering regime of these plants is related, and indeed of all orchids, is related to their relationship with, uh, with fungus, uh, and it's an adversarial relationship between the orchid plant and the, uh, the fungus, and the evolution of the orchid to a large degree is determined by its ability to, uh, to defeat its major enemy there, the fungus, and what defeats the fungus, of course, is drought. Right. These are just a few of the experts that you'll be meeting in the weeks ahead. I'll show you the blasting process and how to protect your plants in cold weather. Well, as you can see, we had some cold weather last night, and I'm coming out here now to check to see if I see anything that looks like it might be damaging. Most of the time, if you do have cold damage, though, it doesn't show up for about two or three days after the cold. Um, we probably went down to 37 degrees here last night, but you see what I do? I have plastic over the ceiling, plastic on the sides, and I have these little kerosene heaters, which I keep everywhere in the greenhouse. Now, if you have a small collection, the best thing to do is just bring them in the house. But remember, if you do bring them in, don't just put them in the garage where it's just as cold as it is outside. Put them where they're going to be warm. Now, if you leave them out, put them somewhere where they're protected from the wind. The best thing to do is put them in one area, cover them with a sheet 
grandpa an old blanket. We used to keep old sheets around all the time just for that one reason and put plastic over the entire thing. Never ever let the plastic touch the plant itself because plastic transmits heat, it transmits cold, and so that what you're doing is you're just intensifying the heat or the cold on the plant. Uh, if you know you're going to have a cold spell, water them thoroughly because they're not as stressed out if they have enough water. And probably the, uh, the best thing to do is to, um, if you're going to use water at all, is to water them in the morning and then if you have to leave the water on all night long, leave it on all night and don't turn it off until around 11 or 12 o'clock in the afternoon the next day. This is Helen Schwartz saying, get growing.